Welcome to Complexity Made Simple. My name is Paul Allen and the subject of today's newsletter is one of these, the X-Bar R-Chart. It's specifically this one, but actually this is really about control charting. We're going to do a little exercise, we're going to take a look at it in a second, but just before we do, I just want to say something about this. I couldn't find an example of a hand calculated X-Bar R-Chart. That is incredible. For no money. This is free money in your pocket. It needs a pencil and a piece of paper. It's a hundred years old, this technique, and with a pencil and a piece of paper, you can get the best out of your machinery. Free money. Why wouldn't you use this? The X-Bar R chart. Let's take a look. Okay, so let's get this um Let's get this exercise started. So, as you can see, um, I've got a title up here for you, the X-Bar R-Chart. I'm going to do it by hand. Um, I thought I'd be able to find this on the internet somewhere. Somebody doing one by hand. In other words, with a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, because if you use a piece of paper and a pencil, it is without a shadow of a doubt the cheapest way to make piles of money. You cannot run your machinery when you are trying to hit targets, whatever it happens to be. If your operator is trying to hit a target with a piece of machinery and they have dials that they can adjust in order to influence the result, uh, whether that's a dimension or whether it's the hardness of the material or whatever it is, the only way they can do it properly is with a, a, a control chart. It doesn't have to be an X-bar R chart, by the way, but with a control chart. And all you need is paper and a pencil. Maybe you might want a calculator as well. So this is the cheapest way to get your machine to do its best and therefore to make more money. And that's what this is about. So here's what we're creating. So this is the chart that we're going to create. It's based on a dimension. So we're going to assume that we're measuring uh, millimeters. Uh, this is the most common chart. It's known as an X bar R chart. When a process is in control, a process which is in control is said to be stable. That basically means the average doesn't move. What's the average? The X bar. So a process is said to be stable. It's also said to be predictable. What does predictable means mean? Well, it means that the range, the spread of the data does not change. That's why there's two charts, because we need to check if the process is stable and the process is still predictable. An X bar R chart. So that's why we're going to do this. This is the most powerful chart without a shadow of a doubt. It's the best one if you can do it. The other thing to say before we get into doing the chart, just some basic rules. The first rule is that you should only put a chart when the process is in control, when it is stable and predictable. Don't go and put this on a process which is completely chaotic. So plot the graph. The graph is doing weird things like this and looks like that. That is not a process in control. That is complete chaos. You cannot put a control chart on something that looks like that. So get the process under control first. Then you use the control chart. The second thing to say is that the data that we collect and I think I might have 25 data points here. I'm not absolutely certain that it's 25. But this data that we've collected 
must be the normal data collection routine. So what I mean by that is if you've decided to collect the data every hour, that's how this data will have been collected. If you've decided to collect the data every day, that's how this data will be collected. What the normal data collection routine is designed to do, it is designed to capture all natural variability. Okay, so it's designed to capture all the natural variability. So if you decide that there are, there's toolware in the machine and the toolware happens over a period of one hour and therefore you decide to take data every 15 minutes to spot the tool where then this is how this data will be collected and that's what this data would include if you decide that there's material changes um, imperceptible material changes just bar to bar material changes as opposed to batch to batch then this would contain that and, and bar to bar material changes might be over a period of every two hours so it would it would contain that maybe there's a slight warm-up period etc it would it would contain the natural variability and that's how your your data collection routine is decided there is no rule here except to make sure that you capture the sort of change periods of your process but most important you have to have the process in control first before you use the control chart so this is the chart we're trying to create so let's let's get on to doing it and of course normally this chart would be completely empty be a blank piece of paper and we just take a pencil and we'd start measuring so let's take a look well in this case look we've decided to take a subgroup of five okay now obviously this is a practical decision that you're going to take you know sometimes this is easy data to get sometimes five measurements could take you an hour so obviously the x bar r chart is something that you only do where it's practical if if the measurements take you an inordinate amount of time to capture it, you might use an individual chart instead but we're taking a subgroup of five uh, the the subgroup of five if you can do it is a more powerful subgroup um, you know three is probably going to be the minimum that you're going to measure in order to do an X bar R chart but if you can do five then brilliant so we measured the five and the five have come off one behind the other so this subgroup this is five these are consecutive and there's the subgroup okay so subgroup one and then we continue until what we've done here is collected let's just check how many i've got one two three four five six seven eight nine twenty five so i've got twenty five data points here i would probably recommend that you go to 50 if you can it's a better it's a better sample size if you can go up to 50 but we're gonna we're gonna go 25 uh, in this case uh, 25 is the minimum uh, so I've got 25 basic data points collected over a proper period containing all the natural variability then what I'm going to do is calculate the average for each group of five so that's what I'm doing there and then what I'm going to do is calculate the range for each group of five so we have data which we can plot up on the top chart up here 
we have data that we can plot down on the bottom chart we've calculated our x bar and our r data and finally what I've done look is I've worked out the average of all the averages x double bar or the grand average and I've worked out the average of all the ranges x bar and these are the two statistics that I need in order to calculate control limits okay so these are the two numbers and this is it now now I have the data to make the calculations for the control limits so the upper control limit here's the statistics look it wants the grand mean the center obviously it would make perfect sense if you could get your grand mean to be somewhere around the target so the the grand mean x double bar and then there's this little phrase here which of course contains the r bar the average of the range and so the only number we don't know is a2 in this little calculation now what a2 is essentially it is a correction factor it is a correction factor which is going to turn the range into a standard deviation value instead because Schuett when he created these these diagrams these charts he wanted an easier way to calculate standard deviation than to use the big complicated calculation where it's the square root of each individual data point minus the average the sum of all squared over n minus one this is a complicated thing to do in the 1920s he didn't want to have to do that calculation so he is using range as a substitute for standard deviation and then a2 is a correction factor in order to get the correct answer and the correction factor comes off a little table of constants that looks like this so a2 look here there's a column of these correction factors we're going to look down to a subgroup we have a subgroup of five therefore our correction factor is 0.58 so we are going to we're going to multiply the average range by 0.58 and then add it to the center add it to the grand mean that's exactly what we've done look there's our there's our correction factor there's our average range we've multiplied the two together there it is and we just add it to the the grand average and what do we get we get an upper limit of 4.015 okay so there's the upper limit now of course we're going to do the same thing for the lower limit the difference is we're going to take away this value to create the lower limit it's going to look like that and there is our lower limit so we were at 4.015 for the upper limit 3.987 for the lower limit very straightforward you can see these are simple things to do obviously you could use a computer if you want to you can create uh, a, a data template so you just type the data in and it does these calculations for you and uh, not a problem but even without a computer a piece of piece of paper and a pencil and a calculator is all you need to do this now what we have to do is the upper limit it doesn't say it on the top here but we we want the upper limit for the range chart and there is only an upper limit in this case okay so now we're going to take the average range and this time the correction factor is d4 I'm just going to multiply those two numbers together to get our upper limit which here's the result down here so let's just find d4 on our table of constants here's d4 and forget subgroup size of 5 our correction factor is 2.11 there's the calc so our upper limit 
is 0 0.051. Now we can start putting all this fine this fine data onto our graphs. So we have the limits. There is no lower limit as it says there on the range. We have our, our three limits. We can now fill out a scale because we know how big the scale needs to be. So we didn't do that until we'd done some basic calcs. So we can fill out the scale. We can add in the, the grand average that we've worked out. We can add in the data. We can do the same on the bottom chart, add in the data, put the average through that. And then we can put the two sets of limits on the chart and don't forget this is a control chart these limits they are control limits control limits they are natural to the process in other words the process told you what they were one important thing this chart this chart always avoids spec limits. Spec limits are forbidden on a control chart. You do not need them. You only need the control limits. The control limits are natural to the process. They are telling the operator the natural pattern that the process is going to adhere to. Whilst the process is naturally adhering to that uh, normal pattern, you are going to leave the process alone. Only if it does something weird like this, moves outside the limit, or indeed maybe it stays one side of the center line, something like that. There are rules around the chart which you can look up. But when it starts to do something strange compared to its natural pattern, then the process is said to be out of control. Now, if you get a point like this, what do you do? Well, you have rules about what happens next. And typically what happens next is you do a process, a very simple process, process audit the operator will have an audit to carry out what are they they are simply checks so it could be that he's supposed to have a certain speed a certain feed a certain pressure a certain temperature he checks them if he is not where the rules tell him he should be he will put the process back on the rule he might have a rule that says he should sharpen the tool every 10 pieces. If he hasn't adhered to that rule, he will follow the rule. So he will put the process in it the exact condition that it should be. And that's what the operator's role and responsibility is. His role and responsibility is to follow the rules. And he uses the control chart to make sure that he's applying them correctly and his machine is behaving naturally. It's really important. His machine is behaving naturally. And when his machine is behaving naturally, he takes his hands off, he sits back, he drinks tea, and he reads the paper. Because when a process is in control, it needs no operator assistance. If the operator is assisting, you have a problem. You are out of control. But when a process is in control, this is when you'll make most money. When your operator is drinking tea and reading the paper, this is when you'll make most money. And you make most money with a piece of paper and a pencil. And that is how to do an X bar R chart by hand. And now, the operator can get on and see if the process is in control. Um, obviously, people do use software for this, and this is something that people go, oh, we use a computer, we use a computer, we use a computer. They love software. I do have a, a computer. 
I do have a computer that will um, calculate a piece of software that will calculate these these limits for me there is nothing wrong with using a computer to do that I'll just show you the the version that I have um, so here's the data that's on the X bar R chart. I have a piece of software called Sigma Zone. And if I go to control charts up here, it will do all the different control charts for me. Uh, here's the data. If I if I simply highlight the data, go to Sigma Zone, go to control charts, X bar R, next, my subgroups are in rows which is correct they are next it's asking me how I'd like the, the, the diagram to look uh, do I want zones calculated do I want a histogram do I want to perform CPK do I want them stacked well I do want them stacked because that's a, the traditional way that a control chart looks for me and then I'm just going to click finish to that so very simple so you can see how quick this is it's just made the, exactly the same calculations look uh, that I've just made um, and there's the diagram for you uh, now I could use this so I can add data to this if I just if I just show you this if I add um, if I add some data I'm gonna add, add some um, out of control data I think so just to show you So if I add data like that, and then I go back to the chart, it now says the chart isn't updated. Would I like to add the extra, uh, the extra data point? So if I go here, uh, I can hit update chart, and it'll put that extra data point on the chart. It's it's not. You can see I made it a little bit too dramatic, but. Um, it, it's not recalculating the limits by the way it's just putting the new it's just putting the new data point on there I shouldn't have put something quite so extreme uh, on the uh, chart but you get the point now you could do that rather than plot these graphs by hand however there is a really important point the operator needs to look at the graph they need to see the pattern as it's been created it's really important that they do so if you use software they have a tendency to put the numbers into the computer punch enter and then turn away from the graph the graph is important because the graph makes money and therefore although I'm happy to do the calcs using software or an excel spreadsheet i would encourage you to do all your control charts by hand you cannot make the, the most of your machinery without a control chart and this is the x bar r chart well there we go that's how to do an X bar R chart or I'm going to do other control charts I'm going to do an individual's chart so there'll be other videos to show you how to do these charts but the point the point is very important these things are super important you cannot get the best out of your machine without one but the same thing is they cost nothing they cost nothing it is money in your pocket it is the easiest way to make cash out of your process so please use an X-Bar R chart. If you want to leave some comments in the, uh, the area below, that would be fantastic, or some feedback. If you want to ask me some questions, please get in touch on my email, or indeed subscribe for more videos.